Mesa on the eastern slope of the pine-studded Rampart Range in the Colorado Rockies. This is the United States Air Force Academy. The occasion, June week, and graduation of the class of 1959. Certainly, June week is not an unusual event. For throughout the United States, thousands of young people are experiencing the thrill and pride that comes with the completion of college. 207 young men within the ranks of these marching cadets, the men who comprise the first graduating class of the academy, feel a sense of accomplishment and pride too. More, they feel the esprit de corps of the professional airman. What kind of young men are these, only a few years removed from high school, from great cities, farms, villages, from the poor and from the rich, from families who crossed the oceans less than a generation ago, and from families whose ancestry can be traced back to colonial days? To the casual spectator, this is merely the pageantry of men marching to the stirring music of a military band. Actually, it is much more. It is the first tangible result of a new concept in military education. These are our Air Force officers of the future. Leaders in the age of supersonic jets, nuclear weapons, missiles, and space vehicles. To really understand what has transpired since these men came to the academy, to measure the accomplishment and progress, to understand the Air Force philosophy of education, let us go back in time to the 11th day of July, 1955. This is Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, the temporary site of the Air Force Academy. Starting at 6 o'clock that morning, the first class of Academy cadets signed in. And suddenly, they were in the Air Force. In a single day, they made the transition from civilian to military life and then found themselves about to take seats for the dedication ceremonies. This was the beginning of a long period of development in their Air Force career. They were only dimly aware of what lay ahead as they listened to Air Force Chief of Staff General Twining carefully and eloquently outline their responsibilities and way of life for the next four years. They were told that as pioneers at the new academy, they were expected to set an example for those who follow. Actually, the Academy is the result of the dreams of other aviation pioneers, men such as Arnold, Spots, Vandenberg, Mitchell, and many others. Many of them are gone now. Only a handful remain. In 1954, Congress authorized the Air Force Academy. The men who shared the dream of an air academy felt that only at such an academy could the United States properly educate, train, and motivate young men for lifetime careers as Air Force officers. After years of working and planning, the dream was becoming a reality. From the plans of engineers and architects, this land was to be transformed into an institute of learning, befitting a new concept in military education. While the men and the earth movers worked, at the temporary academy site, the new cadets began their academic life. The four years of undergraduate study are designed to lead to a Bachelor of Science degree. Special emphasis is placed on mathematics, English, and history. The Air Force believes that knowledge of the physical sciences must be complemented by a broad understanding of man's political, social, and spiritual heritage and aspiration. 
During these four years, the cadets are given an education carefully balanced between the humanities and social sciences and basic and applied sciences. For those cadets who have the ability or previous college credits, there is the opportunity to enrich their learning by taking courses beyond those required for graduation. This permits the student to increase the breadth of his study or to specialize in a chosen area. In addition to the academic program, the academy places strong emphasis on professional military studies. Instruction begins with rugged summer basic training and progresses through a study of the overall Air Force mission. This includes the psychology of leadership and management, and at the same time, practical experiences gained while serving brief tours in junior officer positions with regular Air Force units. To broaden their scope of understanding, the men are given the opportunity to observe Army operations under classroom and field conditions. In addition to this, they study the Navy mission and its role in today's defense program. Also, field trips to military installations in the U.S. and overseas are scheduled, and the structure and function of foreign military forces are studied. To keep fully up to date, the cadets visit Air Force facilities, where they're informed of developments in space technology and the employment of aerospace forces. At the same time, they are given first-hand views of the Air Force's intercontinental and intermediate-range ballistic missiles. While performing duties in the cadet wing, the cadet learns the value of discipline. First as a follower, and then as a leader, the cadet performs duties which instill a respect for superiors, a responsiveness to orders, and the authority of command which is fundamental to military life. A milestone in the history of the Academy came in August of 1958. Although construction wasn't completed, the long-awaited move was made to the new Academy just outside Colorado Springs. A new curriculum, a growing tradition, and a way of life that had come into being during the stay at the temporary site were brought with a cadet wing when it moved to its new home. Shortly thereafter, the cadet wing understood more than ever their heritage of devotion to duty, when the first superintendent, General Hubert R. Harmon, was interred in the Academy Cemetery. Honored, respected, and loved by all, General Harmon refused to slow down and kept working to the very end for the Academy. As the class of 1959 entered its fourth and last year, it assumed major responsibility for the command and operation of the cadet wing. In addition, they were obligated to create a tradition of excellence and high standards of performance. Each year had brought increasing authority, responsibility, and privilege. And although a fledgling in years, the academy was establishing strong traditions. Foremost among them is that if tradition and progress clash, tradition must give way. However, there is one tradition at the Academy that will never change, for it's the very foundation of cadet life, the individual integrity of each cadet as stated in the honor code. We will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate among us anyone who does. Personal integrity is a key factor in leadership and command. A tradition of scholastic excellence was quickly established. Recognition of this came with the accreditation of the Academy as an institution of undergraduate learning before graduation of this first class. This presented an even greater challenge to maintain high standards in such last year courses as law, aerodynamics, political science, astronautics, a foreign language, and military history. In another area, that of intercollegiate sports, the blue and silver clad academy teams were establishing traditions too. With a record of nine wins and one tie, 
the Falcons met Texas Christian University in the Cotton Bowl on New Year's Day. The Falcons held favored TCU to a scoreless tie. But intercollegiate athletics are only part of a year-round physical fitness program, which stresses body contact sports for all cadets. Emphasis on physical development is an important part of the Air Force Academy program to develop a balanced, effective leader. A conditioned, healthy, strong body is essential to meet demands of a service career. And then suddenly, the four years were drawing to a close. It was June week and graduation for the class of 1959. This was the culmination of long years of hard work, discipline, and growth. During the same period, the academy itself had grown too. Although still not complete, the academy, against its mountainous backdrop, provides the facilities, inspiration, and atmosphere necessary for the intellectual, moral, and physical growth of the cadets. During June week, a number of buildings were dedicated. The cadet dining hall was named Mitchell Hall in honor of Brigadier General William Mitchell, one of America's earliest advocates of air power. The administration building was dedicated to the memory of the first superintendent of the academy. As the wind swept across the court of honor, Mrs. Harmon unveiled the 10-inch letters Harmon Hall. The academic building was given the name of Fairchild Hall in honor of General Muir S. Fairchild, first commander of the Air University, who played an important role in preliminary planning for the academy. The memory of the late general of the Air Force, Henry H. Arnold, was perpetuated when the Cadet Social Center was named in his honor. The Cadet Dormitory was dedicated Vandenberg Hall, in memory of the late Air Force Chief of Staff, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg. As June week progressed, open house was held for the families and guests of the class of 59, who had come from the many states and territories represented by the cadets. For the first time, many of the mothers and fathers, brothers, sisters, and girlfriends visited the academy. The cadet quarters. Classrooms, lecture halls, and laboratories. The impressive library, built to accommodate a 200,000 volume general collection, plus a special aeronautical research section. The dining hall. The administration building. The social center, with its theater, ballroom, and lounges. The planetarium. The statue of Pegasus, presented to the academy by the Italian Air Force. Inscribed on it are the words of Leonardo da Vinci, there shall be wings. If this accomplishment be not for me, tis for some other. A number of social activities highlighted June week. There was the superintendent's reception. The ring dance for the new senior class. And a number of informal dances for the various classes and their guests. Athletic awards were presented at a banquet in Mitchell Hall. Awards were made to the many outstanding athletes. Joey Brown, a staunch friend of the Air Force, then spoke to the assembled guests. There was a time for contemplation and reverence, too. On Memorial Day, a ceremony honoring the airmen who died while serving their country was held in the Court of Honor. With the Rampart Range as a backdrop, members of the cadet wing stood in prayer as tribute was paid the honored dead. This solemn occasion characterizes the emphasis given to spiritual values in day-to-day -day life at the academy. 
Opportunity for religious worship is provided to cadets of all faiths, for historically, the strength of man's religious faith has sustained him in times of crisis and adversity. Another event of June week was the presentation of awards for unit accomplishment. The third squadron was awarded the Air Force Association trophy for overall excellence. The fourth squadron received the Malamphy Award for the best intramural athletic record. The seventh cadet squadron was awarded the Steinhardt Trophy for outstanding performance in drill competition. Later, in Arnold Hall, 32 members of the class of 1959 received awards for outstanding individual accomplishment in academic and military performance. The Outstanding Cadet in Basic and Applied Sciences. The Outstanding Cadet in Humanities Studies. The Outstanding Cadet in Military Studies and Economics. The Outstanding Cadet in Mathematics, who was also the Academy's first All-American football player. Rewarding individual talent and accomplishment encourages a spirit of healthy competition, the desire for personal excellence in all fields of cadet activity. This competitive process begins the moment each man applies for admission to the academy and continues with every phase of education and training. In another ceremony, the Commandant of Cadets presented navigator wings to the graduating class. In the future, cadets will receive the fundamentals of pilot and navigator training and aerospace technology. This background will provide a foundation for future specialization. On the day before graduation, the fourth classmen or freshmen, having completed their first and perhaps toughest year at the academy, were welcomed into the ranks of upperclassmen. Then the class of 59 made its last appearance in formation as cadets, the graduation parade. After the cadet wing came online, the cadet commander invited Secretary of the Air Force Douglas and members of the honor party to inspect the wing. The cadet commander then presented a ceremonial sword to the new wing commander to symbolize the passing of responsibility for the cadet wing to the new senior class. Following the transfer of command, the graduating class crossed the parade ground and stood with the honor party to review the remainder of the cadet wing. As the last cadet squadron passed the reviewing party, flights of aircraft from the Air Force Combat Commands flew over the parade ground, saluting the Academy and its first graduating class. Then, a final salute was given by the Thunderbirds. That evening, the cadets and their guests attended the graduation ball. For the members of the Air Force Academy's first graduation class, cadet life was rapidly drawing to a close. The next morning, before a packed auditorium assembled for the graduation exercises, General Briggs, superintendent of the Academy, introduced the speaker, Air Force Secretary Douglas.
Thank you, General Briggs. Members of the Air Force Academy Class of 1959, friends, I'm honored to have this part in your graduation ceremonies. During the 10 years I have served the Air Force in uniform and as a civilian, I have had no experience that I shall prize more than this. Your graduation as the first class of our academy is a splendid event for the Air Force and for each of you a distinction you will always cherish. In his capacity as a personal representative of President Eisenhower, Secretary Douglas spoke briefly of the history of the Academy and of the contributions of the men who had worked for so many years to make it a reality. Secretary Douglas then told the graduating cadets of their responsibility to fully and completely understand the American system based on a government of laws, not of men and to see that it is better understood wherever they may be called upon to go. I know that you understand these characteristics of a free society because you have discussed them in the history, philosophy, economics, and political science courses that have had so important a part in your general education here. Mr. Douglas pointed with pride to the academic achievement tests given to the first graduating class during its senior year. Of the 187 colleges whose seniors took the graduate record examinations, the Academy class of 1959 ranked second in natural science, second in social sciences, and 21st in humanities. The Academy's composite score placed it second out of the 187 colleges. You already know the great satisfaction of service to our country. And today, service in defense of the United States has become service to free men everywhere. You, as the first graduates of the Academy, may well play a critical role in keeping the history of the Western world a history of free men. In all that you undertake, gentlemen, I wish you strength and courage and success and happiness. Thank you. After the speech, the name of each cadet was announced in order of merit, and Secretary Douglas presented a diploma denoting the award of a Bachelor of Science degree. General White presented the commissions to the new second lieutenants. As the name of the last cadet was called off, a tremendous cheer rocked the auditorium. Following this, they were sworn in as commissioned officers. Then the commandant of cadets pronounced the words Gentlemen, you are dismissed. With that, over 200 second lieutenants tossed white cadet caps high in the air. They had made it. After four long years, the moment had arrived. They quickly changed into their officers' uniforms. It was a time for happiness, a time for pride, a time for tears, and a time for the feeling only a mother can know as she pins the slim gold bars on her son's uniform. And now it was time to leave, but this was not the end. For some, graduation meant continued study, more hard work as they progressed toward advanced degrees at graduate schools. For most, it meant fulfillment of their dream, pilot training. From here, they will go into Air Force combat commands.
These graduates and the ones who will follow are the Air Force leaders of tomorrow. They must prove their competence and their faithfulness in the years to come, for they will be the commanders of the aerospace age. The nation watches and waits. Good luck.